Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm doing a solo, no music, nothing flashy, just me talking to you. And I was hoping to actually share, well, I'm not hoping because I'm going to do it, <laughs> but I was hoping to share um, some of the takeaways that I had um, from my own presentation that I just recently put together on the focus on moving from digital citizenship to digital leadership at FETC uh, just this past week in Orlando. And I, for me to put a presentation together, it it's not just a couple hour thing. It takes, I want to say days and days, but it's kind of years and years. And the reason why I say this is because I typically don't like speaking about stuff unless I've written about it comprehensively over the years. And digital leadership is actually something that I defined I think all the way back in January of 2023 uh, on my blog, and I'll leave that link down below from the original, it was January 2013. And digital leadership is simply this, using the vast reach of technology, especially the use of social media to improve the lives, well-being, and circumstances of others. And so this is something that I wanted to really kind of dig into, share some examples and insights. And I think it's getting to become more and more important as there's a lot of conversations about devices, distractions. And my concern all the time is when we take away these things from our students, and I think it's, and this is something I made really clear in the presentation, is that I don't think I'm, there's a right and wrong to this. I think it's very community-based. We got to have conversations, but that we have to have the conversations. I think that's what's important when we just say like there's, there's just a right and wrong and we take away or we don't take away. I think that doesn't really help our students. But my feeling is if you actually take away devices, close these things off in schools, how does that help the students after school? And could you actually do all the things that a student does really well academically? All their scores are great, but then we didn't pay any attention to this stuff. Then you go look them up. And then you see horrible things and all of a sudden the grades don't really matter. And I don't want to think that I think kids are bad. They do horrible things. And it's actually something I wanted to kind of start off the presentation with. And I actually um, started off with a statement and watch people in the room. And I think it's really, really important. I said, if your worst 10 minutes were online, would any of you in this room have a job? <laughs> and... I know I wouldn't, you wouldn't either probably, right? And I actually made the joke that I'm watching people in this room and they're actually sorting between which 10 minutes is worse, which one would they actually be in trouble for? And people that are in my age range, I know many of us, including myself, are like, oh, thank goodness this stuff did not exist when I was in high school because who, how much trouble could I have got in? And that's something that, I thought was really important to point out because a lot of times we maybe villainize our students for doing these things, but we probably would have done the same thing. And, and that really mattered to me. So what I actually did is I shared a story of like what I could have gotten in trouble for at the beginning. And I've shared the story before in my books. Um, but when I was, I think it was my first year of teaching this first or second, and I wanted to be the really cool teacher. <laughs> and, uh, uh, this is how old I am. Google wasn't a thing. It was Yahoo. I don't think Google had even been invented at the time. And we were supposed to do a unit on poetry, but I wanted, I just thought, you know, poetry is no fun. Why don't we do Canadian bands? And so we were doing Canadian bands. We did Tragically Hip. It was awesome. Kids were loving it. And then I remember actually one time we were going to do a research study on um, one of my favorite <laughs> bands uh, from Canada called the bare naked ladies so i actually encouraged my kids hey i want you to go into yahoo search bare naked ladies <laughs> and thinking about how ridiculous this is now that i'm saying this out loud but like who knows what we're going to find at that time and i remember this is this is dial-up internet you can hear the that screeching noise and i'm watching these kids because they're not very good typers and i'm thinking oh my what is going on like what are they going to find if they look this up? And luckily, we were in a computer lab that actually had a gigantic kill switch. And I remember like saying, shutting it down. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, oh, no, no, we're going to go back and uh, read some poetry because I don't want to have anything to do with this. And I think about kind of how ridiculous this is 
is to kind of share this with you. But I, w- I actually started this off because it's really easy to point fingers at others. But I want to say like, hey, I've done dumb things, right? And luckily, um, you know, it's a different time. So I, I kind of make that joke about this too. But, you know, anyone from Canada, you know, understands this. And so I think that's a really important aspect. So this idea of digital leadership and kind of thinking about this, one of the reasons I was inspired was really looking at how students can do incredible things and not how they could, but that many of them already were and how it inspired this. And one of the other things I shared in the presentation was I remember distinctly being in Texas. And when I was in Texas, I was introduced to a group of students I was about to speak to. It was an auditorium. It was totally packed. And they said, hey, here's this guy from Canada. He's going to talk about social media with you. And the second they said that, the students actually groaned. They're like, oh, we don't, like, seriously, we don't want to hear this. And I was thinking, what? what? I haven't even said anything. And they're already complaining. And then it clued into me. These students actually believe what I'm going to do for the next hour or so is say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And just kind of give them crap for things they've never done. So it, I clued in real quick. And then I said to them, hey, does everyone know what cyberbullying is? And they said, yes, I remember that. Yes, <laughs> very distinctly. And then I looked at them. I said, yeah, okay, don't do that. All right, let's talk about what we can do with this stuff. So I showed them examples. I showed them opportunities of things that we can utilize with technology and how we can use this in really compelling ways and only make our lives better. And I think that's an important aspect because if you focus simply on making the lives of others better, but you don't make your own life better, um, then, you know, that could actually lead you to not caring about any helping anyone else too. I think you have to kind of have both of those things. I know that I've benefited greatly from using these spaces, sharing this stuff. Not only, honestly, from a learning standpoint, which I think has been the biggest benefit, but I've opened doors for me myself that I didn't even know existed. And I'm really adamant about students doing this. And consistently, when I share this presentation with students, and I've done this literally all over the world, working with students on these concepts, students will always come up to me and say, this is absolutely amazing because we rarely hear this, if ever. And to actually say, like, here's what you can do. And that's something that... Um, I really focus on, on all the possibilities of how we use this to make our lives better. And when I share some of these things with students, I often say that they're actually held to a standard we can live up to as students. And it's not really fair. And I tell them straight up, it's, it's actually not fair. The standard you're held to because of all these things and, and all of these ways that our lives are being expressed online and, you know, people are going out and canceling each other, whatever. But I also then remind them, you also have way more opportunity than I ever did. So what are you going to focus on? The things that are wrong or the things that are way better? And that's the best way I can kind of approach it because I do believe it's kind of unfair, but I also believe there's more opportunity. That the ways we can learn, the ways we can connect, the ways we can share and create opportunities for ourselves that we couldn't. I grew up in a very small town to think that people know my work outside of not only my town, my province, my country, you know, around the world is just over. I never get over it. It's, it's really, I know people listen to this podcast from all over the world and just thinking about how powerful that is. And so I've really tried to focus on taking advantage of it. So I don't want to get too deep into this and go too long because I could, I could talk about this forever, but I want to talk about very quickly the three things that I shared I went in uh, depth into each one uh, when I was speaking to the adults. Uh, Three things to consider on your digital leadership journey. And not only have I done this with students, but I've also done this with obviously with educators, um, you know, PD, but I've also done this with um, parents and caregivers because they often, in many of them, like a a lot of actually teachers will come up to me and say, you know, I really appreciated what you shared. Um, from the perspective of teacher, but I am like really going to go home and approach this different with my own kids because I've been telling them just to totally stay off of social media and that um, it just like basically hide from that space. And I remember there's a, I think the, the gentleman's name is Dan Schwabble and I'll share the link to that below. He wrote in, I think it was a 2011 
saying that basically in 10 years, your resume will be replaced by what you do online. And like 2011, right? We're 2024 when you're listening to this podcast. And that's why I referenced it because uh, many people, when they're applying for jobs, they're being Googled, whatever. And if you have nothing versus someone who has amazing stuff, well, the amazing stuff person's going to win. It doesn't mean they're better for the job. They just have a more complete resume in our world today. And I think that's a really important aspect of what we kind of focus on. And what we share is that we're giving our students these opportunities. And again, it, this is also about giving opportunities, not forcing students to do anything. If a student says, I don't want any online presence, I'm good with that. But I think sometimes we have some families and students who don't want an online presence and then we use that excuse to not give the opportunity to others. It's about the opportunity, not about forcing anyone to do this. So really kind of looking at this um, from that perspective. So here are three things that I talked about specifically with uh, teachers, but obviously, as I said, this is modified with, for parents, for communities, and for students. So the first one is, you know, one, what are we modeling to our students? Um, if you look at any conversations online, uh, teachers, things like that, uh, adults, I think a lot of times we point to kids doing really um, bad stuff, but I, I do see it a lot with adults. And I'm very cognizant of myself, and I don't want to, you know, say that I've had like a perfect presence online or anything like that. And the best way for me to actually kind of think about how I set an example of what I'm doing online is all of these podcasts, tweets, everything is really actually a diary to my kids one day. When I'm gone, what will be left? And this is part of it. This is part of what will be left to my kids. And I look at this as a way to provide them advice ideas, but also see a side of me that, you know, they might not remember at some point or whatever. Uh, And thinking about that too, I, I, I always have encouraged that you shouldn't have a personal account, a professional account, but you should have one space. And that space, the standard that I have, and that I encourage people to consider is that if you can say it to kids in a classroom, you can say it online. So I talk about my family, I talk about uh, my dogs, I talk about my love of sports. But I also understand context. There's things that I share personally, you know, in a face-to-face conversation with very close friends that I don't share online. And it doesn't mean that I'm inauthentic. I just understand the context and, you know, and maybe the lack of context. So really kind of thinking as adults, are we asking our kids to be something that we're not and sharing this too? And I think it's really kind of powerful because we know, you know, you get a new teacher in a community, kids are Googling them. Families are Googling them. Why am I having such a hard time saying Googling? Googling them. And and, uh, and I think it's powerful to see, learn about who they are as an educator, as a teacher, as a principal, whatever. But I think it's kind of cool to see who they are as a person and what they model because, you know, kids are looking it up. Are you giving them an example to, to live up to and sharing this? And some of the conversations I see online um, are really focused on... Um, sometimes maybe villainizing people that don't agree with us um, that have different things. I think it's way better to, we we focus so many years on um, student voice and giving uh, people the opportunity to share their voice in the world that if everyone's sharing their voice, is anyone actually even listening? And so really it's kind of learning to step back, ask questions, try to, you know, seek first to understand and then be understood, you know, Covey principle. I think that's a really important aspect. So the second one is, are we setting expectations at high or low levels for our learners? And this goes back to the conversation with the students in Texas. Um, I often ask educators, if you were to focus solely on cyberbullying, what is the best result of that action? And honestly, the best result of that action is, please don't be horrible people. As long as you're not horrible, then we're good. It's kind of a low bar. And here's the other thing. When you focus on cyberbullying, say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. You sometimes actually put really bad ideas into the heads of kids. And I can't, uh, my friend, Michelle Baldwin led me onto this. And this is, there's some research on this. And it was like a really simple question that if I say to you right now, do not think of an elephant. I kind of think you're thinking of an elephant. That's what's popping in your head. And so instead of focusing on what you shouldn't do, it's really focusing on what you, what you can do. So I talk about these three levels and the, 
lowest level to me is cyberbullying. And I explained that in a second. Digital citizenship, I understand. It's kind of like, you know, think about your passwords, how you are online, all this other stuff. It's not really focused on um, the bad stuff, but it's not really focused on the good stuff. And so what I've talked about is that idea of focusing on digital leadership, setting, you know, like actually using this to elevate our own lives and the lives of others. And I think if you set that really high bar of what you can actually do, there is some real power in that in how we share. So really, again, are we setting expectations at higher low levels for our, our learners? Uh, I want you to also think about this, not just with digital leadership. This is how I try to think with everything I talk about. Um, there's a huge difference between the idea of literacy and fluency. So if you think about fluency in a language, you could probably tell a joke to make people laugh in a different language. So literacy is where we start, but fluency should always be the goal in whatever we do. So like instead of financial literacy, good start. Financial fluency is the place we need to go. So just kind of thinking about that. What are the levels we expect uh, uh of our learners and, and are we actually setting that bar high or are we just kind of aiming for the middle or even sometimes low ground and so the third one is how do we empower students to make their lives and the lives of others better in this part of the presentation i really shared um students who have taken the opportunity to use these spaces to make the lives of others better and i remember this one video the student uh what he had done is he went on Facebook, Instagram, and he said, look, if you can be mean using these things, why can't we use this to make, um, make the lives of others, or the, the lives of others better? And, you know, why can't we lift people using these spaces? So I actually focused on that and sharing that. And what was really fascinating, that student changed the culture of their school, but also inspired students around the world who saw this idea and said, I want to actually do this. And I think that um, there's a lot of peer pressure I remember one time I was having a conversation with students and one of them said to me, if I start doing good stuff, I'm going to be teased mercilessly because it's just normal um, in our school that we use this to kind of be mean, share inappropriate things. And it's almost terrifying to think that someone that would actually um, be scared to do something good in the space because it's not the norm. And I actually remember I've had this conversation I wasn't expecting to talk about this, but it popped in my head, so I will. Um, I actually remember um, seeing a teacher say on Twitter, or X, whatever you call it now. I, have to, I can't just say X, I have to say, or whatever you call it now. I don't know why. Saying, I'm having a really good, I, I don't want to say this, but I'm really having a good year. Why wouldn't he want to say that? Why wouldn't he want to say have a good year? And my concern was that if he said he was having a good year, some people are like, oh, everything's bad. And it doesn't mean there aren't bad things in education, but he was scared that if he said things were going well, somehow people go after him. And I think we always have to say like, hey, things aren't always great, but for me, here's what's working really well, and here's what I did. Always show the example, and I, I really believe this. If you complain about a problem nonstop, at the end of your complaining, guess what? It's still a problem. We have to show solutions and ways that we can do better things. And, you know, you don't change anything by complaining. You only change it by doing. And so I think that's part of it. So thinking about who are, who are the students already, not just the adults. Like you can show adults too, but already who are people in that same age group using these spaces to do incredible things, to actually make their community better? And I'm talking community like locally and globally to improve the lives of others, to, you know, just even silly things to make people smile. And I think that's something I really try to do. I always try to go on to these spaces and want to interact with people. If I, if I feel like I'm going to say something, I'm not, that isn't going to lift that person up. I try not to say it. I can't, I would love to say I'm a hundred percent. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying desperately to be a hundred percent. And I, I always keep this in mind. And I, I just never know what's going on on the other side of the screen. A second, like a comment made, it, it might take you two seconds, but it could ruin somebody's day or longer. So I'm always thinking about that. I don't see the reaction on the other side of the screen. And I think that's really important. So the three things that I, I'll, I'll share with them very quickly again, what are we modeling to our students? Are we setting expectations at higher low levels for our learners? And three, how do we empower our students to make their lives and the lives of others better. So that's what I focused on. And uh, 
I hope you got something out of this. I loved presenting this. This was absolutely amazing. It was the first time I actually did this presentation with adults. And it was very, very well received. And uh, I, I'm still trying to get better at it. Still trying to grow. I always tweak and kind of go through and try to find new examples, change stuff um, to, to really kind of, you know, not only um, give people ideas, but challenge their thinking and also show how my thinking has changed over time as well. Because I know that um, I used to be, I know that sounds weird. I used to be really anti-technology because I thought it was, there was like a dumbing down. But when I really started using it to improve my learning, that's where I saw opportunities. And if we want to help the kids, we got to kind of embody the opportunities ourselves. So just want to share that with you all. And weirdly enough, this is one of the ways that I'm building my footprint and sharing this podcast with you. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but thanks for all you do. Have a wonderful day. Take care.